Uh, you can open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay because the scriptures are going to be put on the screen. Luke chapter 9. Next week, we're going to start into the book of Titus. Titus is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to Titus, who was charged with kind of setting in order the churches in a place called Crete. And it's a very, very practical book. And when we get into the book of Titus, you're going to find there's practical instructions for older men, older women, younger women. That might be a little controversial when we get into that one. We'll see. Uh, Younger men. There's instructions there for leaders. What, What are the characteristics of good teachers in the church? There's a whole lot to choose from out there, right, as far as teachers and preachers and what type of character should a teacher of the Word of God have, should elders have. It's all there, very practical, and uh, so we're going to get into that next week, an introduction next week, and we're going to take that as basically like a mandate for the church. We're going to read it, Paul's letter to Titus, this is how the church ought to be organized, this is kind of what our calling is as believers, and we're just going to try to apply that, right? Uh, Very practical. So we're going to start that next week, Uh, and so read over Titus this week if you have an opportunity. It's only three chapters, still probably going to have about 30 sermons but it's only three chapters, uh, so take some time to read that over, listen to it, audio Bible or something, familiarize yourself with the text uh, before we start into that series, because we're going to be there for a while, so starting next week. But for today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 9, verse 28. What is your experience like living life in this world? As far as this side of eternity, right? I mean, heaven has not come yet. And be thankful it hasn't, because if this was heaven, we would be in trouble, right? And so you experience all sorts of reminders on a daily basis that we still live in a sinful world. And so that's manifest in all sorts of ways. And so you have broken relationships, uh, you have financial turmoil, you have health issues, uh, you have wars and rumors of wars and uh, global unrest, uh, you have political leaders that are corrupt, you have all sorts of things that just reminds you constantly that things are not perfect and that we're all, and and, and I think a comfort is we're all in this together, right? I mean, this is the human condition. This is the reality of life, this side of heaven. You try to make sense of the world and say, what in the world's going on? Why is the world like this? What's all the world coming to? Well, scripturally, we receive some instruction. Yeah, we get a biblical worldview as to why the world is the way it is. The Bible explains that. And frankly, what's happening in the world is perfectly consistent with what the Scripture says is going to happen. But it also tells us where the world is going. It's all going to come ultimately under the authority of Jesus Christ. But beyond that, the Scriptures tell us how to live life in the midst of the corruption and sin and so on while maintaining a spiritual perspective. Our faith is designed, get this, our faith is designed to engage in this life. Our faith is not designed for, oh, you know, when perfect circumstances come along, then I'll be able to live for God, then I'll be able to worship. That's not what our faith. Our faith is designed to carry us through persevering in the faith, being faithful uh, to Him, even in the midst of what you're dealing with. And so, relational problems, personal problems, personal failures, uh, you get the difficulty in the workplace, you get the familial issues, you know, all of that. Our faith is designed to engage in real life. And so we're going to see that a little bit today in Luke chapter 9, verse 28. And in this scene, there's two scenes here. But I want us to see the contrast between the, between the scenes and kind of learn a lesson about the contrast between these two scenes we're about to see. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. It says, now about eight days after these sayings, he, that is Jesus, took with him Peter, John, and James, three of his disciples, okay? Three of his disciples that he chose uh, from the twelve. And so he takes Peter, John, and James, and they went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. Now, if you're new to church, you're new to Scripture, I need to tell you, that Moses and Elijah at this point are dead. They have appeared from heaven with Jesus and Peter, James, and John on the mountain, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. 
Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they came fully awake, they saw his glory, and the two men stood with him, who stood with them. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Now, that's scene number one. Scene number one. What is it? Peter, James, and John on the mountain. And what happens? Remember last week we were talking about Jesus Christ, and we were talking about him as the second person of the Trinity. We learned that God, the Godhead, exists a perfect community, loving community, in which there is harmony uh, and, uh, and love. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Godhead has existed from all eternity past, and within that Godhead there is loving community, unity, uh, and so on. We learned that last week, and Jesus Christ is as much God as the Father and the Spirit. We learned that last week. What's happening in this passage? Peter, James, and John are given the privilege of seeing the veil peeled back somewhat and for Christ's glory to be seen. And so during his earthly ministry, that was veiled. In fact, Jesus Christ was so kind of nondescript that when they came to arrest him, Judas had to kiss him on the cheek so anybody knew who he was. He didn't walk around like the paintings you see with some halo around his head and so on, and you know, or the old, you know, they would do the old uh, Jesus uh, movies or Jesus shows, and uh, he always had this permagrin on his face like Joel Osteen, and he would just kind of uh, float around constantly happy, and, and uh, this weird per- depiction of, uh, no, he appeared for all intents and purposes to be a regular man uh, from appearance sake, but here on the mountain, what happens? God allows Peter, James, and John to get a glimpse of who Christ really is. His glory shines through. That's, and not only that, but they see Moses and Elijah, Moses and Elijah representing what? The law and the prophets. And so Moses and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets, are speaking to Christ about what he's about to accomplish on the cross, where he would fulfill the law and the prophets. And then they hear a voice from heaven. So, I mean, this is just like experience after experience after experience. And then God the Father says, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Amazing, incredible experience. We know it's incredible because Peter responds. And Peter, even when he's kind of in a stupor, still says some pretty interesting things, right? Master, it's good that we're here, verse 33. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses. One for... We want to stay here, right? I mean, this is like an amazing experience. He's saying, I, we just should stay here. And it says he didn't know what he was saying. Peter and James and John got it. They were experiencing something that nobody had ever experienced. And they actually didn't speak of this event until later on. Uh, Peter writes about it in, in Peter's uh, uh, epistles or Peter's writings. So... An amazing experience. Get to see Christ for who he is. Get to hear the voice of the Father. Now, this would have been like an experience of uh, wonder, yes. Also would have been like a time of vindication and encouragement. Because as Christ is walking the earth, there's varieties of people. Some are receiving him. Some are rejecting him. Of course, the Jewish leadership are rejecting him. Uh, they're not, some are believing who he says he is. Some are not believing who he says he is. But what do they get to see? They're like, well, there you go. There's the evidence. Yeah, this, is, this is him. This is the Son of God. There's his glory. God the Father has just testified. Here's Moses. And, I mean, they see it's all real. They get it. This is all real. We, we get to see it. It's behind the scenes. At this point, they weren't operating by faith. They were operating by sight, right? I mean, we actually get the privilege of seeing behind the scenes. So that's scene number one. They get to see the glory of Christ. They get to see hear the testimony of the Father. They get to see the spiritual realities that other people were not seeing. But then there's scene number two, starting in verse 37. On the next day, and that's important because this is a consistent timeline. This is the next day right after these events. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him, and behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. 
While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. What a stunning contrast between these two scenes. After coming down the mountain, kind of reminds me of like Moses coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments. Remember, what does he see? He comes down and he sees the children of Israel worshiping idols after he's just come out of the presence of God, right? Similar situation. Here they are coming down the mountain and Peter's there on the mountain. I mean, comfort, peace, fulfillment, vindication, seeing the glory of Christ. That's the mountaintop experience, right? And they come down just into this valley. And what do they hear? Argumentation. You hear the scribes, and you get this from some of the parallel passages in uh, Mark and Matthew, and the scribes are arguing with the disciples. What? I thought you could cast out demons. And frankly, they could. They were doing that before this. Jesus granted them that authority. So the scribes are questioning, and uh, the disciples are like confounded. Like They don't know why they're not able to cast out this demon. Uh, the boy is convulsing. The father's distraught. The father's unable, and uh, so on. This is the scene they come down to. I mean, talk about a downer. Mountaintop to the valley, right? And so this is the scene they come down to the next day, and it says a crowd runs to Christ, right? Because they're in turmoil over this, but then they see Jesus. They're like, okay, well, there he is. Let's go. Let's bring this to him. And so in verse 38, they come, and the man from the crowd cries out, Teacher, I beg you, look at my son, and so on. Tells him about the situation. He's frankly possessed. The spirit seizes him, suddenly cries out, convulses, foams at the mouth, and so on. And uh, he says, I begged your disciples, verse 40, I begged your disciples to heal him, but they could not. Verse 41, Jesus answered, O faithless generation, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And frankly, what you read in the book of Mark is that this father sees Christ and he kind of, he implores Christ, and he says to him, if you can do anything, this is his, his, his request, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And so in verse 42, they bring the boy, and he starts convulsing, rolling around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus rebukes, and Mark tells us that he said, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out by him and never enter him again. And then after crying and convulsing him terribly, uh, it says that he is healed. It says that he is healed. In verse 42, he gave him back to his father, and all were astonished at the majesty of God. And then Matthew 17, which is a parallel passage, it says the disciples came to Jesus privately afterwards and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here, to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And again, just to emphasize the contrast between these two things. Down off the mountain, there's the arguing, there's the inability, there's the demonic power, there's the condemnation coming from the scribes to the disciples. Uh, they are doubting the power of God. They're faithless and so on. The father's feeling, feeling unable to help his son. And I say all that and try, I want to picture this because Kind of the scene in the valley is kind of like where we live, kind of in our daily life sometimes. And you face this in your daily life, whether it's family life or whether it be employment or whatever it may be, you face this. I mean, you face the skepticism and doubt and feelings of powerlessness and hopelessness and faithlessness and sometimes just cluelessness, right? You experience that and I experience all of that. Uh, sometimes that's just how we feel we live down there in that valley. The advantage that Peter, James, and John had, however, and this is the point I want to make, is that they came down into the valley in the midst of all of that, but they had a wonderful advantage. They had been on top of the mountain, so they got to see the spiritual realities. Even though life down here seems hopeless and trying, they kind of stretch us, and sometimes it can really be a downer, and we don't know what to do in life. There's a reality behind the scenes, and that is Christ is all-glorious. Christ is all-powerful, and as we're going to see, He's willing to exercise all that power and authority on our behalf, because not only is He willing, but He's also, not only is He able, but He's also willing. And so that's really the story here, a story of contrast between life in the valley and 
the reality on the mountaintop. What these events teach us is that even while we're in the midst of this world and subject to the effects of sin, which cause turmoil and doubt and so on, the reality is Christ is all-powerful. He has unmitigated power and glory, and he's willing to exercise it on our behalf. So, we're going to give us a few points this morning on how we can maintain that type of mountaintop faith while we're living in the valley. First of all, we need to believe that Christ is able. Christ is able even when circumstances are contrary. You understand what happened there on the mountaintop is that Peter, James, and John were able to see the glory of God in Christ, right? I mean, I mean if they had any doubts, remember when they were on the ship and all the wind and the waves and everything, and they were worried, and they come down, and Jesus is there asleep, and I mean, they're worried. They're saying, Jesus, we're going to die, right? A little bit of doubt there that uh, Jesus had the ability uh, to change the situation. But they're up on the mountain. They see the glory of God in Christ, which then gives them a perspective through which to see every circumstance of life. You say, well, that's a wonderful privilege. I wish I could have been there. I mean, if I was there, then I would believe and I could handle anything in life because I know Christ is on my side and He is the glory of God, right? I mean, I want to show you something. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. This is speaking to believers. It says, For God who said, Let the light shine out of darkness... That is, that creative power, right in the beginning, let there be light, has shown in our hearts to give the light of what? Of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's saying that God the Father, for those who believe, what has happened in your life as a believer is that God has granted you the faith to understand that the glory of God is seen in the face of Christ. In other words, the experience that Peter and James and John had where kind of the veil was torn back so you could see that Christ is the glory of God, the radiance of His image, has happened to each one of us when we have believed in Christ. You've come to faith because you've understood that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, right? You've come to faith because you understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, how did you come to that conclusion? Because God Himself did a creative act, shining in your heart the knowledge the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And you see it. You're like, oh, He is God. He's God in the flesh. I see it now, right? I understand it. I believe it. And so you've responded to Christ. And we're to grow in that knowledge. Paul, in writing to the church in Ephesus, he has a prayer for them in Ephesians 1.16, and he says, I do not give, I do not cease to give thanks to you, thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. I want you to know more about Christ, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His great might." That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one that is to come. What is he saying? I want you to see all the power and authority of Christ. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Practically speaking, what this is for you and I as believers is we're constantly growing in an increasing knowledge of who Christ is, what He's done for us, what He has waiting for us as far as inheritance is concerned, eternal life in His presence. He wants you to understand more and more your standing before God. You're a sinner, but because of Christ, you're declared righteous, and you've been adopted into the family, and you have a right standing before Him. This, this, we're, we're to increase in this knowledge throughout our lives. And what's happening is more and more and more, the reality of the glory of God in the face of Christ is becoming clear for us. Our circumstances do not determine or diminish the power and glory of Christ. The point is we're to keep this spiritual perspective even when we're going through the drudgery of life, right? He's in control. He has power and authority. Uh, he has brought me into relationship, he has an inheritance waiting for me, and so on. And you say, well, that's hard. That's hard. And it is hard, and it takes faith, right? 
And you say this morning, well, I don't, I don't really have faith, or I don't have a lot of faith. That was the case in our passage. Jesus says to his disciples, well, you couldn't cast this one out because this comes by prayer and fasting. He says, oh, faithless generation, He's saying you didn't have faith. But it's not a matter of them not having really a quantity of faith. It's more of a quality of faith. And this morning you say, I don't have enough faith. Well, I want you to look in Mark chapter 9. You don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screen. This is a parallel passage. In this passage where Mark relates these same events to us, he shows us something about the father of the son who came to get healed. And in verse 22 of Mark 9, the father says of the spirit that has possessed the son from childhood has often cast him into the fire, into the water to destroy him. And then the Father says to Jesus Christ, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And so now if we were just to stop there, and I were to say to you this morning, no matter what you're going through in life, no matter what the difficulty, I mean, here's a, a guy whose only child is possessed by a demon and is constantly convulsing him, foaming at the mouth and so on, and he can't do anything about it. He thought he had hope in the disciples. They couldn't do anything about it. I mean, absolute hopelessness, inability, that's what, what this man felt, okay? You're at this place in your life, okay? And I say to you, well, just believe, just believe. And, and you say, well, that you make it sound easy, but the fact is I don't have that type of faith. So what's my response? Well, too bad. Sorry. Sorry it's not going to work out for you. Look what happens here in our passage. The Father says to Christ, if you can, Mark 9, I should say, Mark 9, 23, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. What is Jesus' response? What, unbelief? Okay, sorry. Can't help you. What happens? The response to the confession of the Father, I believe, but I help my unbelief. And you're tormented by unbelief, aren't you? I believe, but help my unbelief. And what's the response? Jesus Christ heals the boy. As we're going to see, because Jesus Christ is sympathetic to your weaknesses. He's sympathetic to your unbelief. He's sympathetic that even when you're expressing faith, you're tormented by the fact they, there still remains so much faithlessness. So I want to run through a few promises that we have in the Scripture to maybe help our unbelief, to help our unbelief. Where faith comes from is taking God at His Word, and so you have to kind of know God's Word in order to exercise faith because you see reality, and reality looks hopeless, but then you remember God's promises, and you live according to the promises, not according to your circumstances. That's what faith is, but you've got to know God's Word in order to exercise that faith. And so let's talk about a few promises we find in the Word of God that could help our unbelief. Number one, the Bible says of God, or He says of Himself in Hebrews 13 verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And I love this passage because this is an example, because I've been using that idea of like mountaintop faith, a mountaintop experience and living in the valley, right? Well, in this one passage, you see both of those things. The mountaintop is God's declaration, I will never leave you or forsake you. The valley is where we take that spiritual reality and then we say, okay, because that's true and the Lord is my helper, I'm not going to have any fear. So then we kind of shed our anxieties and we kind of shed our fears and kind of that hopelessness, feeling as if we're adrift and kind of the waves of fate. And we say, no, he's never going to leave me nor forsake me. Spiritual reality. Practical living, I don't have to fear. He's never going to leave us or forsake us. Next of all, we're told that nothing can separate us from his love. Nothing can separate us from his love. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Having given a list of things that cannot separate us from the love of God in Romans 8, it says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is, if God says He loves you, He loves you. 
when you enter into that covenant with God, when you come to God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, that's an inseparable love, adopted into his family. Nothing can separate you from his love. And so all your fears of falling short and all your fears of not being accepted and all your fears of not having a right relation, it's all, they're all diminished, aren't they? We understand it's not about my performance. It's not about whether or not I succeed. It's not a matter, matter about whether or not my faith is perfect or anything like that. Uh, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ for those who are His. So He'll never leave us. Nothing can separate us from Him. And then just practically speaking, Paul, we're writing to the Philippians, was reminding them after they had given a very substantial sacrificial gift to him, he tells them, my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says that God knows what we have need of even before we ask, right? The fact is God knows you better than you know yourself. The Bible says he knows and can count every hair on your head. And that's just a reference or a, a figure of speech saying he knows everything about you. He will supply your needs. He knows what you have need of before you even ask it. He'll never leave us. Nothing can separate us from His love. Next of all, another promise, His grace is sufficient for us. His grace is sufficient. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he's praying to, he's telling how he had prayed to the Father because there was something in his life that was tormenting him. I mean, some weakness that he had that was, he thought was somewhat debilitating that he wanted to be taken out of his life. And so he prays to the Father, and he recounts this to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he says that the Father responds to him this way, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more, Paul says, all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. If you're under some impression, again, that you as a believer, you know, once I finally overcome this thing, once this thing is taken out of my life, then I'll really be able to be a Christian. <laughs> then I'll really be able to make spiritual progress, spiritual success. Understand, the human condition is such, you have weakness and you have faults and you have failures, and I'm not trying to disappoint you here, but some of those things that you think, man, once I overcome that, I'm good to go. Some of these things are going to be with you all the way until your death or the coming of Christ. You say, well, that's discouraging. It's depressing. No. Look at Paul's response here in 2 Corinthians 12. I mean, God says no to Paul. Like, no, I'm not going to take away that weakness. I'm not going to take away that thorn in the flesh. I'm not going to do it. What's the response? Because my grace is sufficient for you. What he's saying to Paul is, this thing that's in your life that I'm allowing there, it keeps you dependent upon me. It keeps you fully aware of your frailty. It keeps you fully aware that you can't do it in and of your own power. And so I've likened this before to like, I know it's true in my own life, almost like a dial, right? Where God has something in your life. It doesn't seem like it's going away. It's an ever-present struggle for you or weakness. And sometimes what we need is a reminder that we're dependent. So what God does is he just kind of cranks that dial up in your life. Is that reminder that I need him. I need his grace. I can't do it on my own. And so a promise that we have is his grace is sufficient. Where my weakness cannot meet the challenges of life, I understand his grace is sufficient for me. And so he, he will never leave us. His, we can never be separated from his love. He'll supply all of our, our needs. His grace is sufficient. He's sovereign. He's in control, right? It says here that the people are wondering at the majesty of God as he healed. When Peter, James, and John are on the mountain, they hear the voice of God, and they realize regardless of what they had just experienced uh, down in the valley or would experience in the valley, they're given a glimpse understanding that God's in control. Psalm 115.3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Proverbs 21.30 says, No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. In other words, the circumstances you're experiencing in some way are a result of the sovereign working of God. He is in control. It seems out of control. You feel like you're the victim of other people or circumstances at home, but the reality is God is sovereign and He is in control. And some of these things that are working in your life ultimately are going to work for your good. And sometimes that good simply comes out of our proper response to those things. 
Because Romans 8.28 says, we know that for those who love God, and that is a condition, right? For those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. All things. It doesn't say all good things work for good. All things work together for good for those who love God. So, He will never leave us or forsake us. Nothing can separate us from His love. He will supply all of our needs. His grace is sufficient. He is sovereign over circumstances. He is working for our good. And you say, well, it's all well and good, but it sounds to me like you're still talking to, you know, the super Christian who has amazing faith and belief. Well, that's not the case at all. You say, I'm just overcome with my sin. Well, there's another promise you can claim there because 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Now, let's just park there a little bit because this is a, there's some passages that are just, you just count it like a privilege to be able to teach, right? And so if you're here this morning and you're like kind of out of, out of your comfort zone, maybe you don't go to church a whole lot, maybe you're, uh, or, or maybe you do go to church a lot, but you're one of those people who feels like you don't quite fit in because I'm not like them. Understand the Bible says that if we say we don't have sin, we're liars. This is not talking, I mean, this is talking to, this is, this is if we, John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. That's an authoritative statement. Everybody here this morning has sin, right? If you, if you say otherwise, you're a liar. One of the things that I'm thankful for about Calvary Baptist Church is that when you come to Calvary Baptist Church, you know, some churches, it's like, They hand out masks at the door. And I could have made that comment last year, and you'd know what I'm saying, but now you don't because of COVID. I'm not talking about medical masks. I'm talking about superficial phony masks. Coming to church and you put on a mask. We talk, feel like we're all super spiritual, and we have it all under control, and we don't have any problems, and uh, pretend like everything's cool, and then when church is done, you put your mask there, and then you actually go live real life. Well, God help us if that's ever the case at Calvary Baptist Church. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And we don't say any of that to lower the standard of holiness. Like we understand we want to pursue Christ and we want to pursue holiness and we want to grow in the faith and we want to have spiritual victory and we want to be praying people and so on. That, that we, we strive for that standard, but the reality is we fail along the way, absolutely. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and He can be just because He's already judged our sin in Jesus Christ, right, on the cross. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so He will never leave us. Nothing can separate us from His love. He will supply our needs. His grace is sufficient. He is sovereign, working all things for our good, and... He will forgive our sins. Those are all spiritual truths and spiritual realities. Those are the things you can come to understand. If we want to use the picture again, mountaintop, spiritual realities that we understand, but you can take those truths and employ them to live while you're in the valley. Believe Christ is able, even when circumstances are contrary. Next of all, in the next three minutes, point number two, You say, okay, I believe, okay, Jesus is the Son of God. It's the glory of God in the face of Christ. They saw it. I understand that. But just because Christ is who He is doesn't mean He's willing to exercise that stuff on my behalf. He's never going to leave and forsake me. I'll never be separate. I will never be separated from the love of God. He's always going to supply my needs. And so your inferiority complex has come in, and your inferiority complex is not because you don't think much of yourself, it's because you think too much of yourself. Get your focus off yourself. Get your focus off yourself. It's not about your worthiness. It's not about whether you measure up, whether or not Christ is going to exercise His power on your behalf, as we're going to see. This father begs Jesus and says, I believe, help my unbelief. But Jesus responds with healing. What does that tell us? It wasn't about the Father's deficiencies, was it? It was more about Christ's ability and His willingness to heal this boy. The fact is, 
Jesus Christ is both able and He is willing, even in the face of our failures. The disciples had all kinds of, even the disciples in the valley had all sorts of information about Christ. We have all sorts of information about Christ. We have His completed Word and we have the revelation of Himself to us. We have a record of His works and His ability and His love and His compassion and His care for us. We have examples of men and women who have lived lives of faith all around us. We have the clear witness of the church and the teaching of His Word. We have past experiences where we receive answers to prayer. We have all sorts of things that point to the reality of who Christ is and what He's able to do. Yet we still fail in our faithfulness on a daily basis. There are times where we feel like we're living in continual spiritual struggle. We feel as if circumstances of life are overcoming us. We feel as if we're being tossed to and fro on the waves of fate, yeah? But these thoughts only arise if all we know is life in the valley. If all we know is this world, and we never look beyond and try to apply what we know spiritually to real life, we're going to be overcome. Life seems as if it's hopeless and rudderless and beyond our control. And even when we see like glimmers of hope in the face of Christ, believing He's present and able, we suffer doubt as we're confronted with our own faults and failures, believing that He may be able, but maybe He's not willing. But I want to show you something in Hebrews chapter 4. And again, it's a passage that I come to a lot because it's so significant and helpful. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Because of that spiritual reality, let's live this way. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to what? Sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Understand this about Jesus Christ. He's not only able because He's the Son of God, but He's also willing. Why? Because He sympathizes with your weaknesses. The weaknesses that you think have pushed you into a category where Christ is unwilling to exercise all these spiritual uh, blessings in your life, He is sympathetic towards. He's sympathetic to your weaknesses. That's one of the reasons He became incarnate, walked this life as a, as a man. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. But now look at the passage. It says, because we understand he's our high priest interceding for us, and he is sympathetic to our weaknesses, verse 16 says, so then let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. If you're here this morning and you have found yourself in a time of need, end of self, unable, kind of like this father was with his son, or even the disciples unable to heal. You find yourself just kind of at the end of your rope, I don't know what to do. Understand that Jesus Christ is sympathetic. He understands your weaknesses. He understands your situation. He understands what you're going through. Not only that, but he has the compassion to want to respond to your struggles. And so what do we do? Well, we can with confidence, with confidence not because it's still up there, not with confidence because of who we are, but with confidence because we know who He is and what He's willing and able to do. And so with confidence we come and we say, Lord, help me, help me, please help me. I know you're willing and I know that you're able and I know that you're willing not because of who I am, but because of who you are and because you're compassionate. And we can come to find grace to help in the time of need. In Mark chapter 9 Verse 22, which is the parallel passage to this one in Luke, the father says, this demon often casts my son into the fire and into the water to destroy him. And then the father says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us. What is compassion? The two words there, calm and passion. Passion meaning to suffer, and, and that prefix C-O-M means to, together, right? To suffer together. If you can do anything, have compassion. Well, Christ did have compassion. That is, Christ felt the suffering of this father and the son, and came and answered with healing. Not only is Jesus Christ so powerful that he's able to lead us through life's trials, but he is also so compassionate, compassionate that he's willing to help us through life's trials. Believe that Christ is able even when circumstances are contrary. Trust Christ is willing even in the face of our failures. And then lastly, and we'll summarize it because we just hit on it a little bit, 
Exercise our God-given responsibilities even when we doubt. Exercise our God-given responsibilities even when we doubt. You say, I'm faithless, uh, help my unbelief, and so on. It's okay. Sympathetic to your weaknesses. He understands your plight, and that's a fine prayer to say, I believe, help my unbelief. But we have a responsibility. Jesus says to his disciples, this kind only comes by prayer and fasting. That is, go to God in prayer. We just saw in Hebrews. So then with confidence, we come to the throne of grace to find help in the time of need. Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But that comes after we exercise our responsibility, which is to take everything to Him in prayer, right? And so regardless of Christ's ability and His willingness, there's still some responsibility on us, isn't there? We have to go to Him in prayer, and we need to express that faith to Him. And here it says the response or the consequence of that will be peace, the peace of God which passes or passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so He's able, He's willing, He's compassionate, He's sympathetic, and so take your struggles to Him. Take your struggles to Him. No fear of rejection. No fear of inability. So in conclusion, tremendous contrast. Heavenly scene, disciples get to understand who Christ is. I mean, unmitigated power. There's no veil there. They get it. They understand it. It's not a matter of faith at that point. It's sight for them. They see it. Any questions or doubts they may have had when they're down in the valley are eradicated on the mountain, okay, that's what they got to see, but then they come down, and it's real life. Well, you and I live there in the valley, don't we? And again, let me just emphasize, this is the nature of the Christian life. This is what your faith is designed to engage in. We're not here to build some monastery and go off and to try to reach spiritual ecstasy and escape from this world. Our faith is designed to engage in this world. But we engage by understanding the spiritual realities, by faith, believing them and embracing them and seeing all of life through that lens, right? And so there's a stark contrast between what was happening on the mountain and what was transpiring in the valley. Sure, but the fact is their faith was designed to engage in what was happening in the valley. And so... Let me just pose this question to you in closing. Out of those two scenes that we saw, the mountaintop, the valley, which one of those things were a better reflection of reality? Which one of those things were a better reflection of reality? I mean, up on the mountain, you got Jesus Christ's glory revealed. You have Moses and Elijah there. You get a voice from heaven. Okay, very supernatural. And then in the valley, I mean, you're down in the dirt there. I mean, you got criticism, you got doubt, and you got all that going on down there. Which one of those things was a better reflection of reality? You say, well, both to a certain degree, both. I mean, what was happening down in the valley was real. But I would suggest to you that ultimate reality was better reflected on the mountain than in the valley. Because in the valley, things appeared to be hopeless, but they weren't. In the valley, things appeared to be powerless, but they weren't. The fact of the matter is Christ was able. Christ was powerful. Christ was willing, so there was hope, and there was power, and there was ability. And so what's the better reflection of reality? Well, the mountaintop. And so I say to you, get in the Word of God, like Paul's prayer to the Ephesians. Read it, understand who God is, understand who Jesus Christ is, understand what He's accomplished for you, understand what He has in store for you, understand what He wants to do for you, understand what your responsibilities to Him are. Read it, know it, because that's where ultimate reality is, which then you take and engage in real life uh, through that perspective or through that lens. So that's how we have a mountaintop faith in the midst of the valley. Now, if you're here this morning and you haven't yet received Christ as your Savior and Lord, uh, you need to do that. And so um, God has given us the Lord Jesus Christ uh, so that we could be saved. That's the plight of all mankind. We're all sinners. And you see the effect of sin all around you. I mean, much of the turmoil you see in life is the direct result of sin. Uh, you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. We're, we're fallen separate from God, uh, separated from Him, really subject to His wrath and deserving of punishment. But the Lord Jesus Christ came and He bore that penalty for us. God the Father in His love sent His Son. Jesus Christ walked this earth, lived a perfectly righteous life, the only one who ever has. 
But then he gave himself as a sacrifice for us. Mankind rejected him. He was crucified. But the ultimate suffering of Christ on the cross was not the nails in the hands or in the feet. What it was, was God the Father at that moment received the Lord Jesus Christ as a substitutionary sacrifice for us. That is, he was offered in our place. And so he, the righteous one, was offered for the unrighteous, right? He, the sinless one, was offered for us, the sinners. And what happened was that God the Father then punished Jesus Christ with the punishment that we deserved. He was our substitute. God the Father poured his wrath out upon Christ that we deserved. Jesus Christ, being absolutely perfect, the Son of God and sinless, was able to bear that wrath. The Bible says he died and was buried, and three days later he rose from the dead. Well, what is that? Well, he was buried, but death couldn't hold him, right? I mean, the penalty of sin, which is death, really had no bearing upon Christ because of who he was, and so he rose from the dead. He took our sin, he bore it, the penalty, overcame that. Death itself then uh, was overcome, and Christ rose the victor. And so he's taken care of our sin, hasn't he? And the Bible says he's risen today at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. And so there's only one way to be saved. If any man will come to the Father, Jesus says, they must come through him. The apostles in uh, the book of Acts said, there's no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. It's only through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that God the Father has granted to Christ the power and authority to grant eternal life to whomsoever he chooses. And so this morning, understand that Christ is the only Savior. It's the only way to be saved. He's the only one who has borne your sins. And so what's the prescription for salvation? God says, honor the Son as you would honor the Father. Understand He's the Son of God. Understand He lived a righteous life. Believe that He died on the cross for your sins, that those sins are paid for. Believe He's risen again. But Jesus Christ has made the way clear. He said that eternal life comes to those who believe those things and follow Him, right? Right? And so there is responsibility there. You believe, and the Bible says also you repent. You repent and believe. What is that? Well, you turn from the life you've been living for yourself, right? You turn from the life you've been living for yourself. Say that I've been living apart from God. I've been living for myself. I haven't been living in faith. I haven't been living submissive to God's will for my life. That's repentance, right? And so you forsake that. and You come to Him. And so express your faith in Christ. Express your repentance from your sin. And the Bible says that whoever, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, or if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God has, uh, that he has risen from the dead, it says you will be saved. You will be saved. That's, a, that's another promise, isn't it? And so repent of your sin, believe in Christ, and the promise is you will be saved, right? All these promises that we just put here, uh, put out there today, apply to you then. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer, please. Dear Lord, we thank you for salvation, and we know that really you've shown us the key to living life as human beings. All of humanity is seeking to deal with sin and the effects of sin, and mankind oftentimes deals with sin in unhelpful ways. Um, those who are struggling with the effects of sin, maybe sometimes they're driven to substance abuse or they're driven to some other addiction or some just give themselves over to their employment or become obsessive in their relationships or whatever it is. But Lord, mankind is faced with the struggle of their own sinfulness and separation from you. And we see our culture just convulsing under the throes of that reality, the lostness of man. Lord, we understand, think about Christ as he looked across the crowds and he had moved with compassion because they appeared to him to be as like a sheep without a shepherd. And that's what the state of mankind. So Lord, we recognize that. We know though that you've given us Jesus Christ. You've made the way so that we can have the right relationship with you that you've designed us for, that you are willing to adopt us into your family because of Christ and that you give us all the grace and everything we need to live a godly life in the midst of this fallen world. So help us, those of us this morning who are Christians, to live out that life practically, to learn more about Christ, who He is, what He's done for us, to learn these biblical promises, to claim them, 
to increasingly strengthen the biblical lens that we have so that we can interpret all of life through the spiritual realities so that we're not overcome by life in the valley. So help us to grow that way. And then lastly, Lord, if there's any this morning who are not yet believers, I pray they come to you in faith, expressing their belief in Christ as your Son who's died for them. And also repentance, uh, turning from a life without you uh, to a life in submission to you, recognizing Christ as their Lord and Savior, and uh, turning from that life without Christ out from under your authority and uh, choosing then to live uh, under your authority and for Christ. I pray that they would express that to, to you in faith. And we know that'll be imperfect and that'll be weak. Uh, but Lord, you're sympathetic to our weakness. And uh, even a weak faith or a belief with a confession of a struggle with unbelief uh, can be answered by your compassion. So we pray that you would save this morning. And the Lord, with your, your promise, we understand is that those who believe, you grant your Holy Spirit and you give them the power and ability uh, to learn what it is to overcome the struggles of this life um, through the power that Christ gives them. Lord, we thank you for that. And those this morning that you save, I pray that they would continue in the faith, uh, that they would engage that with, uh, with the church and your word and they begin using the means that you've given them to uh, handle life for your glory. Lord, we thank you for this and all that you do through your word, and we pray that you continue to grow our church through it. We pray that, Lord Jesus Christ, would continue to be exalted and honored, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.